Amen. Yes. <laughs> We're All going right. to start with Luke chapter 23, verse 38. And yesterday we went through um, Jesus getting to the cross and Jesus getting on the cross. We talked about Simon of Cyrene. That was who, amazing. Who carried the cross of Jesus. I was literally seconds before that's on the phone with a dear friend telling him that story. Oh, I didn't it know was, that. It was oh. awesome. Just talking about how God's sovereignty is so incredible. He uses people, puts them right where he needs them, changes the course of history, and at the same time, you have free will to make any decision, and it'll always be in the plan of God. Yeah. So tonight we start in Luke chapter 23, verse 38, and I, we're going to, again, chunk this out, take pieces. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to read you verse 38. Let's just stop It says, that. there was a written notice above him, Jesus, which read, this is the king of the Jews. You're like, okay. <laughs> What's the significance? I mean, Luke clearly thought this was important. What is the significance of yeah. this? Well, it, it was important. We actually get a fuller picture if you take all four of the Gospels mm -hmm. and you kind of take what they said and put it all together. So I think if you take the full picture, it said something to the effect of this is Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. And we're told in John that it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. So what they used to do is when they would execute a criminal on a cross, they would always attach to the top of the cross above his head a sign. It was indicated as a just pure humiliation with his name, where he was from, and what he was convicted of. So you have who he was, Jesus, where he was from, the Nazarene, he was from Nazareth. And then, interestingly enough, he hadn't been convicted of anything. Yeah, he had no crime. No. So they have to decide now what to put there. Exactly. And they choose the king of the and, Jews. And it's not just they, it's Pilate particularly mm -hmm. who chooses this inscription and tells whoever is doing the writing, some soldier, I, I assume, exactly what he wants on the sign. And they, they mount it above his head so that as he is hanging there, he actually is the king of the Jews. I mean, again, Pilate, he doesn't know what he's yeah. doing. He's mocking. This was not so much to mock Jesus. This was to throw it in the face of the Jewish leaders. Exactly. This was actually a direct call out on them. Pilate didn't want to crucify Jesus. And so this is like his last jab back at them because Pilate always has to have the last word. And so he puts up king of the Jews like, this guy, this guy is your king. Look how pitiful you are. Look how pitiful people. your king is. I mean, remember Ridiculous. what Jesus would have looked like by this time. Horrible. He was basically unrecognizable. He's been beaten and, and his beard ripped out and blood loss and now he's all out of joint. I mean, really just as awful as it can possibly get. Yeah. And Pilate goes, there's your king, guys. You wanted it. You got it. And he is mocking these Jewish people, which of course they hate. And so they they ask Pilate um, in John 1911, or sorry, 1921, Pilate is asked to alter the inscription on this sign by the religious leaders. And they say, don't, don't put that up there. They said, um, put up, he says he is the king of the Jews instead. And Pilate says, nope. And Pilate could do this because according to Roman law, that inscription could not be altered. Once you put it on, done. It couldn't be altered. So at this point, he was able to say to them, sorry, it's, it's Roman law. And I guess they kind of compromised at that moment too. Like they got what they wanted. So they yeah, apparently kind of back off on that one and they don't throw a really big stink because I don't think they think that they can win this. But here's the thing that's so incredible is that you've got this... Um, this pagan Roman petty king who accurately identifies who Jesus is yep. and then lords it over the Jewish people. And it's just this, I mean, he doesn't know what he's doing. No. I mean, it's part of why when Jesus says, Lord, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Many of them did not understand the brevity or the gravity of their actions, right? And just the significance of it. He doesn't realize that he's just accurately identified the Messiah himself. Yeah, it's, it's and, pretty incredible. And lords it over the Jews as they kill their Messiah. 
Well, let's move on. Um, let's do verses 39 to 43. Let's do one. it. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Mm, this is one of my favorite We need to camp out on this. Stories in the Bible. And I'm so grateful that God in his providence saves this thief on the cross because it helps us understand salvation. Yeah. It also gives us a lot of insight as to what happens to a Christian after death. I mean, there's such an economy of words here. Remember, every time they go to speak, they have to, with these nails through their, we say hands, it's probably right about here. So if it was here, it would rip. So they would put their hands down at the bottom. Uh, they would have to push themselves up to get a breath, which of course their backs were just shredded by this point in time. All their bones and joints are out of joint. And it sends searing pain up through all their nerves into their neck it's just, and up their legs. It is probably the most painful thing ever. So yeah, but they have to if they're gonna breathe. Yeah. So if they wanna talk, it hurts really bad to talk. So this one thief, Actually, we're told earlier and in other Gospels, both of the thieves were hurling insults. They both start by hurling insults at him. And then one of them Something is changes. overcome. And you can see the Holy Spirit working in and on this guy as he listens to his comrade over there, two down from him on the other cross, who just continually just disgusting, blaspheming, taunting Jesus you know, if you're the Christ, if you're the Messiah, get off the cross and take us off too. And, and this guy uses what little strength he has and what great pain to hoist himself up to say, what are you doing? You can see such a heart change yeah. in this guy. Um, Lorena says, I have also, I've always been told his name. She'll finish that thought later. Oh, okay. Yeah, Keep I was going. gonna say I don't. We don't know the names of these guys. We're not. No, told. we're not told the names of these guys. Um, but the the abuse of Jesus was actually worse than that of the other two. You you have to understand. Mm -hmm. He was he was beat and destroyed prior to getting to the Romans. Then they beat him. Then they you know flog him. And on top of that, in mocking him as the king in their eyes they put this crown of thorns on him mm -hmm. they put this heavy coat on him and then tear it off ripping all the skin off his back um so he's he's undergone far worse torture than these other two who are just normal criminals and get the normal flogging and beating yeah exactly so so let's talk about this guy we do not know his name if you have a name it didn't come from the bible so that's all i can tell you is we we just aren't told what the guy's name is we can find out in heaven someday That'll um, be exciting. we know he was jewish because he speaks of the fear of god mm -hmm. and it says that he was waiting for the kingdom or he wanted to be um in, remembered in the kingdom thank you remembered yeah. in the kingdom with jesus so those are very jewish things the romans yeah. would have had no concept of fear of god and they certainly wouldn't have been looking for any kind of a kingdom yeah he's also repentant did you get that that he acknowledges like he doesn't make any excuses yeah. verse 41 we are punished justly we are getting what our deeds deserve yeah and he's telling the other guy this like what is wrong with you do you have no fear of God. One of the things that happens when we truly, and we've been saying this for like 63 Bible studies now, it's not about the words you say so yeah. much. It's about the heart condition that you have. The words should reflect the heart. So I guess the words matter in that respect. Like hopefully your heart is. But you can't just say the words and have it be a day. Exactly. And he knows because you always see repentance in people that are truly coming to Christ and you always see just a sense of the fear of God in them. And I don't mean like trembling afraid of God so much as an awe and a respect for who he is and that he is a God of not just love and compassion, although he is that just infinitely so, mm -hmm. but he's also a God of justice 
and holiness and wrath against sin. And that balance there, I think, really produces a holy fear in us. Yeah. And just an awe of, whoa, I, I can't even begin to absorb this as a human being. Yeah. And Loretta makes a nice point. She says it's so wonderful to hear Jesus actually telling him of his salvation. Love One of it. the things that's wonderful here is this guy acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah. Yes. He says, your kingdom, right? You, the Messiah, your kingdom. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. You will be saved. Wow. Okay. So this guy on the cross is now saved. Jesus recognizes his heart. By the way, both of the thieves asked Jesus to save them. I don't want you to oh, miss that. Oh, it's a very interesting point. Yeah, uh, in, in verse 39, the one criminal said, save yourself and us. Yep, he says the right words, right? Save us. Mm. The problem is, it was totally sarcastic. Heart condition. No, no heart in that at all outside of sarcasm. So both of them asked, but only one gets saved because only one has the right That's heart condition. That's a really good point. It's not a rote prayer. It's not saying the right words. It's always, always, always about the heart. But anyway, there's no time for this guy to get baptized. No, to take communion, certainly not. Certainly not that. Also, notice that Jesus doesn't say, today you will be in purgatory. Where, because dude, <laughs> I mean, you've lived a whole bad life. How are you, how are you gonna pull this off today? I mean, you don't even have time to, to do anything good to help. So um, you're, you're gonna, gonna have to go place. to purgatory. If anyone should go to purgatory, if there were such a place, it would be this guy. And Jesus says, no. He says, no, no, no. I am paying for your sins today, not in the future. Today, you will be with me in paradise, which is a biblical term for heaven. They're interchangeable. Jesus says, you'll be in heaven today with me. Wow. I mean, what do you think that did to that guy? hanging on the cross to hear Jesus say that. It's really interesting from literally in the span of a moment, go from immediate and eternal damnation to eternal salvation. Wow. I mean, just seconds apart. Uh, that has to be, I mean, in some ways this guy got the absolute most incredible salvation, right? Absolutely. And I do want to hear from you. Like, what do you think was going on in this thieves' mind as Jesus was saying to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, what do you think he was feeling at that moment or thinking in that moment? Yeah, Zara says his clarity of faith is stunning. It is. In that moment of his own death and Jesus in the moment of atonement, there was such profound clarity. It's a really mm. interesting, he's in a moment of death, Jesus is in a moment of atonement. Yes. He's bringing us He's making it possible for us to be at one with God. Absolutely. Yeah. Lauren says, what? That's too easy. Speaking as to what yeah. might have been going through the yeah. criminal's mind. Louise says, relief. Oh, can you imagine the I, relief? I can't. I mean, the like psychological horror of dying for, I mean, sometimes it would take them days to die. With Usually. This method. It was horrific. So the psychological horror of being tortured and dying for days, suffocating for days, so you finally did, is tempered with, I was just saved by the Messiah himself next to me. <laughs> I will be with him today in heaven. It's incredible. Roberta says, the guy was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so. incredible. Mary, his mind was probably blown. Susie, he no longer had to fear his death which was imminent. Margie mm -hmm. says, he did say, remember me, much as he may have thought it was close to impossible. That's true faith. Mm, it sure yeah. is. And you know what else it shows? He believed in life after death. Ooh, yeah. He believed in a resurrection. Obviously, he didn't know exactly when. He just said, remember me in your kingdom. I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you have a kingdom coming. I mean, that's incredible faith to go from mocking this false messiah to realizing this is not a false messiah this is the messiah okay so second question 
what do you think was the turning point? I mean, we're not told, so it's all conjecture, but I want to hear from you. He starts out mocking with the other guy. They're hurling insults. They're saying, hey, if you're the Messiah, come down off the cross and take us too. He starts out like that. We're not told at what point, how long went by. Was it a half hour? Was it an hour? Was it two hours? I don't know how long it was. And all of a sudden, he completely 180 flips it. What caused him to flip? like that. Yeah, and let's just talk about how of all the moments in Jesus' ministry, this should not be the moment that you believe he's the Messiah. This could I mean, you've got a guy next to you who's beaten within an inch of his life and is bloody and dying the same horrific death you are. That's not a picture of a Messiah mm. at all. Of all the times to decide, this is not it. But I think Dottie really points it out. She says the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He was given supernatural, divine insight and wisdom. Terry says the truth set him free. Mary points out Jesus' demeanor was very calm. He was, he was very in control the whole time. L Loretta says perhaps his demeanor was just forgiving. Mm -hmm. Kim, I think, nails it. Holy Spirit was in his heart. Um, Terry says Holy Spirit took hold of his heart. Um, Roberta said seeing how Jesus was reacting to the mocking. It's a really good point. I mean, yeah. Jesus is at no point defensive or um, even uh, angry, mm -hmm. righteously angry with these people. I mean, he's he's sad, he's devastated, he's in horror, but he's not f like furious as you would be when somebody's mocking you. Um, Lawrence is pricing the love of Jesus, his gentle reaction, Jesus praying for his persecutor's forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that was a moment when Jesus looks at them and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The guy was like, that's not a normal response. What? That's not. The guy's like, I'm not praying that right now. Yeah. That's Plus, an they had thing. to know what, what was above his head. Like, whatever there said, you know, I, I robbed the 7-Eleven or I killed somebody or whatever. Jesus says, the king of the Jews. I mean, they know there's no indictment. They yeah. know he's innocent. Very interesting. Robinson, when Jesus asked God to forgive them, I think that was the turning point. I kind of wonder that, too. And Susie says the same. Maybe same. Jesus asking God to forgive them was mm. the turning point. Um, it would definitely impact you. Yeah, I mean, it? before that, he just looks like some sorry loser who got caught up in an insurrection scheme and got in over his head. And then he starts responding to these people in a way that is so different than what any anyone should have done. Louise makes a good point. He was a Jewish man. He may have remembered the prophecies. Mm, that's excellent. Oh, that's really good. Boy, I had not thought of that one. Excellent, excellent point. That's why I love listening to what you guys have to say. You bring up stuff I miss. Well, and I, I you know what? I might have to go to a different, let's see here. So, so in the other gospel accounts, they, they give account of Jesus uttering the, the very famous words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Although that hasn't happened yet. That's true. That hasn't but again, that yet. is a direct reference to prophecy. So I think yeah. that is very likely mm -hmm. your point. Zara, it seems it gets back to the heart. If he took a moment to pay attention to Jesus, I think he would feel his love and the presence of God in him. Mm -hmm. And so he truly saw Jesus. Robin, he's watching this guy hang and suffer on the cross just like him, but all Jesus is doing is showing love with authority. Mm -hmm. Another like interesting that. point, like I said, Jesus is not defensive on the cross. He also has authority about him on the cross. We'll see in a moment, Jesus decides when he dies. Absolutely. He's, I mean, 100% in control of what's going on here. Yep. And that's probably very noticeable to this guy. They've Love never seen your anyone. thoughts on yeah. this guy. Never seen anyone like it. Well, let's go on to verses 44 to 46. Yeah. This is Luke chapter 23, verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Sorry, I'm going to cry again. We're good. We're good. <laughs> We're soon going to be through this and yeah. to the really celebratory part of it. It's just really hard to hear. Yeah. I mean, imagine Jesus saying those words, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. Okay. Well, 
Before we get into those verses, I want to insert here, I was really spent a lot of time today trying to figure out like how to, how to give you some information that's sort of like sidebar, but super, super important and where that all falls. So I'm gonna stick it in here because I want you to understand the parallels with what's happening on the cross and what's happening with the Passover. This one, we don't wanna miss because the picture is absolutely unbelievable. And some of it we've alluded to or talked about before, but I wanna put it like all together yeah. for you because I think your mind will just be blown, especially if you're not familiar too much with this. So remember that the Jewish people have celebrated the Passover where God passed over death for the firstborn in the households and back in Egypt, if the blood was on the doorposts, kind of the shape of a cross, if you think about it, the death angel would pass over. They've been celebrating this for over a thousand years. And for over a thousand years, they've had to slaughter lambs many, 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 many times, but especially on the Passover, uh, Passover as they commemorate that because they needed a substitute, which was the original Passover. Does the firstborn die or does the substitute, an innocent lamb that did nothing wrong, die in his place? And God accepted that lamb as a substitute as long as it was a perfect lamb. So here's the thing. The timing of this Passover, this particular year, super precise, and you're going to watch everything fall into place. And just remember, Jesus was always 100% in control of everything that was going on, including down to the very hour that he died on the cross. No mistakes, nothing left to chance. So Exodus 12 tells us in detail that the Jewish people, the children of Israel, were to choose a lamb for the Passover sacrifice on, get this, the 10th day of their first month, it's not the same as our first month of January, their first month would have been April, the 10th day of the first month to choose the Passover lamb four days before the slaughtering of the lamb. Now, is that precise or is that precise? Jesus rides into Jerusalem. We talked about this on the 10th day of the first month, according to John's chronology, which means that both God and the Jewish people chose their Passover lamb exactly on the day that Jesus rode in, which means they chose the Passover lamb with a capital L. So you remember Jesus. on that day when Jesus rode in, they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, please save us. There's this messianic fervor and they basically acknowledge him as the Messiah that day. Okay, so on that day, they choose, you are the Messiah, you will be the atonement, you will be the Passover lamb. They didn't know that that's what was going on. But God knew. God sure did. And, and it was God very, chose the lamb. And again, it was very specific because we need to now walk Jesus through so that we never have to have another Passover lamb again. Amen. Continue. All right. Then the first five books, they call it the Torah of the Bible, instructs that the lamb must be checked very, very carefully while it exists with the family it, who chose it. It lived in the house. Yes. They would take this little lamb and it would come live in the house with them like a little pet. Yes. Which they, they had to live amongst it and they had to check it for any blemishes. Very careful inspection of this lamb. After Jesus rides into the, temple, <laughs> into the city, he goes to the temple to teach. And if you remember from our study a few weeks ago, he is approached by the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the scribes, or the teachers of the law. And each of these groups poses what they think is an amazingly difficult question because they are trying to find in Jesus some blemish, some theological blemish that they can capitalize on and execute him. And they cannot find a blemish because he is the perfect lamb. He answers each question perfectly where there's then no room for argument. They don't even have, they can't even come back at him on anything. They and so find fault. he is inspected by all the teachers of the law, everybody, and found to be without fault. He is without blemish. The lamb 
is indeed inspected. It is perfect. And it is perfect. He is perfect. Now, of course, they don't know this, but God knows this. And we can look back and we can see this. Then, in the Passover celebration in that week, they were to cast out all the leaven from their house. And from what I read, and if you're Jewish, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it sounds like devout Jews today who celebrate Passover do this today, where they will go through the house. They will sweep out under the refrigerator and in the cupboards. They will vacuum out the couch cushions looking for any breadcrumbs that would contain yeast, any leaven. It all has to get out of the house, all of it. So they would do a very thorough sweep, get all the leaven out. And what happens when Jesus goes to the temple, but he casts out the wickedness of the Sadducees and the whole temple operation. He throws all that leaven, which he often refers to them as, be careful, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and yeah. the Sadducees. He casts all that leaven out. All that sin that was in the temple that was permeating, he clears it out and then he keeps it out over the course. You remember, he basically takes over the temple, sits down, and is like, nobody's coming back in. He turns over their tables, he shoes them out. You're done for the rest of this week. That's right. And I so just cleaned out my out. father's house, got all the leaven out of my father's all house. All the leaven is gotten out. This is amazing. Now, Passover Eve begins at sunset because sunset is when the Jewish day starts. And we, sunset to sunset. We talked about this, how way back in Genesis chapter 1, when God establishes a day, he says there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so he establishes for the Jewish people that a day starts in the evening where we think of it as starting in the morning or at midnight, which is what the Romans did as well at this time. But the Jews still had this. So anyway, Jesus and his disciples were settling into the upper room for the last Passover Seder as Jerusalem sunset marked the beginning of the 14th day of the first month. The 14th day being the day the lamb had to be slaughtered on. Jesus, and we talked about this before, so it's just a review if you've been with us. Jesus wanted to both celebrate the Passover to keep the law perfectly because as a Jewish man, he was required to do that and also be the Passover lamb on the same day. There was no way to do that unless we have our days going from sunset to sunset or sundown to sundown. Yeah. So he and his disciples celebrate the Passover Thursday night. And then the following day is when the, the lambs will be slaughtered that afternoon, in the temple. All of the lambs get slaughtered in the temple. This is incredible. This is incredible. So when you read like the sixth hour, the ninth hour, things like that, remember yeah. we're going sundown to sundown. So it's it's different. So it talks about the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m. At the ninth hour, there was a long blast of the shofar. Are you familiar with the shofar? It would be like a ram's horn, very long. They would blow it. It had many different means of significance, depending on what the time of day and year and festival was, but they would blow it for different occasions. They would blow this shofar at 3 p.m. to signal the beginning of the Levites, those who worked in the temple, the, the tribe of Levi, the priests, to begin chanting the Hallel, which was the book of Psalms, chapters 113 to 118. I'm going to put that in here for you because you need to read this. I was just about to say, I'm not going to read all of Many of them are very, very short. Like I think um, maybe it's 116 or 117. It's only like two verses. So it would not take you long to read all of them. I read them all today very quickly. It will blow your mind what they are chanting at this 3 p.m. hour. Now, as that happens, the gates to the inner court were opened and the first crowd of Israelites came with their lambs rushing in to slaughter their lambs at three o'clock. And within minutes, that clean spotless courtyard was just covered in blood as they would throw the blood against the altar and that blood was spilt. Then the dead lambs were hung on hooks, forearms spread in a crucifixion pose pose as they were skinned and ready to be eaten in a crucifixion pose at 3 p.m. Let me just give you 
a smattering of some of the things that they would have been chanting. And I keep saying at 3 p.m. There's huge significance here, and you probably can guess what that is. <laughs> Here's what they are chanting, some of it between Psalm 113 and 118. The cords of death entangle me. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death for his righteous ones. Open for me the gates of righteousness. And then my favorite, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. It was at 3 p.m., the very hour at which the Passover lambs were being slain in the temple, that Jesus, that perfect lamb of God, died. Exactly, 3 p.m. And then we're going to read even more about that in just a minute. I have to go back to... What what would what did I stop at? Six hour darkness over the whole okay. Darkness over the whole land. So now I'm kind of going to go back to um, verses 44 to 46, and we're going to pick that apart just a little bit. But I hope that I hope that that helps a little bit with the significance. As Gentiles, if you're like us, you don't celebrate Passover. It's just not part of your um, heritage. You wouldn't naturally catch the parallels that God so. Uh, perfectly wove into this story. Emily says this takes my breath away. It, yeah. it should and it will continue to. Yeah. Wait until this. Verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour and That's darkness noon. cave came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Noon to 3 p.m. Darkness comes over the whole. Darkness doesn't come from noon to 3 p.m. So this is a severe event that we're talking about here. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. What is going on? Okay, well, some people will say, well, it was probably, a, maybe it was a solar eclipse or something. Here's the problem with that. Number one, we're talking pitch black. Immediate. No sun, not just, oh, it's a little darker now. Not that at all. Not even like dark at night because there's yeah. no moon, there's no stars, there's no sun. There's nothing you cannot see your hand in front of Let's your Let's be clear. The, the Romans and the, the Hebrew people were very aware of the heavens. And they did a very nice job tracking the heavens. And they knew what eclipses were. And they knew what solar eclipses and lunar eclipses were. And they could identify that. And you'll even see places in ancient writings where it talks very specifically about these eclipses and they'll have special words for it but they knew it was a movement of the heavenly bodies that's not what luke says what luke says is that darkness came over the whole land that's not an eclipse that's not what this is plus it's passover which is based on the full moon you can't have an eclipse with a full moon and margie so well pointed out this is a three hour, an eclipse is very, very short. Yeah. Not three hours, and certainly not total darkness. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so people go, okay, so what, so what was this? What, what on earth happened here? A lot of people said, well, that, because Satan was, you know, doing his thing and he's the prince of darkness, so prop, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, so no, 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 no. <laughs> Satan is not in control. Can I get a high five for that one? He, he is not in control of this moment. Satan right now is grasping at straws because he sees that he is about to be utterly, completely, totally crushed and defeated by our savior. And he will be. And that is why he's influencing the, from the prisoners on the cross to the people down below going, come off the cross if you're the Messiah, come on, do it, do it. And taunting him, it's his last hope to get Jesus off that cross because if Jesus dies on that cross and he pays for all the sins and Satan is defeated because and we're saved. we have forgiveness. He will never have us again who choose to believe in him. So no, it is not Satan at all. This, my friends, is Jesus taking on himself the wrath of God. The wrath of God is very much associated with outer blackness and judgment. And I'm going to have Let's Noel. Go. Yeah, I'm going to put these in the comments for you. I'm going to have no, And I will try to remember on YouTube to put these in comments. Sometimes I forget to do that for our audience over there. There are so... I'm not even going to read these. But if you want to look these up later, Noel is commenting. Yep. I'll try to remember to do it. How many Old Testament passages deal with God's judgment as total darkness? And this is a scary, 
scary darkness. Now remember, this was at between noon and 3 p.m. These people didn't have lamps. Yeah. You would have, it's really bright, You're not really prepared sunny. For this. It's desert in April. It's hot, it's dry. It doesn't rain in April very much in Israel. So there's no way they're prepared with any kind of light, which also means, by the way, that all those people that have this comedy vaudeville stupidity going on at the foot of the cross that they thought this was a big joke that this was their king and let's give him a scepter and put the crown of thorns on his head and all not of a this. joke anymore not real funny now not a joke now they can't leave because they can't see they can't walk away they have to stay there in pitch blackness and of course they don't know how long it's going to last for all they know this is forever they just don't know it is absolutely terrifying the judgment of God and then well let me just say this how far did the darkness go it says it covered the land we just don't know was does the land mean the whole globe does it mean just Jerusalem does it mean all of Judea is it all of Israel we don't know that we're just not told but believe you me people took note big time and it scared them out of their mind uh, as it would then at, um, at 3 p.m., Matthew tells us something else that Jesus said. And so I'm going to read this to you. Um, Matthew's Gospel, I think it's chapter 27. I think I forgot to write this down. Um, it says, Now from the sixth hour, that would be noon, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani. And I'm sure I didn't say that right. Which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So let's just get an idea of what's happening right now. The sun comes back on, it's the ninth hour, and Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's, that's an odd thing to say when you think, well, the sun just came back on. And what I think is so odd, <laughs> so horrifying is you see a glimpse into Jesus' humanity at this point, is the lights come back on, the sun is back, and he is still experiencing the wrath of God. And in a good storyline, when the lights come back on, it should have ended, and he's still under the duress and the wrath of God himself, and cries out in agony and horror, my God, my God, God, why have you forsaken me? It is not over yet. Mm. And it's just, I think it is both a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus and also a very clear rabbinical message to the people who just underwent that and saw it with him. Absolutely. And I like what Susie says. She says, was that darkness also a taste of what hell would be like? Absolutely, positively, yes. What we see here, and we've said this before, what did that entail? Jesus taking the eternal wrath of God for all who would ever believe, paying for our sins in three hours. Like, how does that happen? What does that look like? What exactly did he undergo? We don't know very many details, and I think it's because as as finite fallen humans, we just can't understand yeah. it. There aren't words that the writers could have put down no, that we, we could comprehend. We seriously do not know exactly. But here's what we do know. We see a little glimpse of hell as Jesus is suffering what if he does not pay for our sins, we choose to suffer We're for an eternity for. in hell, except we can't pay it, which means it never, ever, ever, ever ends. With Jesus... It took an infinite God to pay that infinite price in three hours. We have no hope. We can never pay it. So we see darkness, and, and hell is absolutely referred to as outer darkness, where you cannot see your hand in front of your face. And then this, like Noel said, it's almost like in his humanity, he thought, okay, I think it's over. And then he realizes that God is gone. That I mean, get this. There is... A lot of people think, oh, hell is ruled by Satan, you know, like that's Satan's domain. No. No, no, no. It's God's hell. It is not Satan's hell at all. And God is not there. 
any hope that we feel in this life is gone there. Any love we feel in this life, nothing there. Any compassion that we would have in this life, not there. Anything good is not there. And God himself, you can't cry out to him. He's not there. He's gone. He's not there. And Jesus shows us that tiny little peek at hell when he cries out. He has for all of eternity been one with his father. And at this point, he doesn't, it's the only time Jesus does not refer to God as his father. It, do you remember the times mm. we've talked about where he says somebody's name twice? Simon, Simon. Martha, just, Martha. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Every time it's like this, this intense emotional like disappointment. And he says, my God, my God. He's so broken. Why have you forsaken me? Where are you? I'm not done. You're gone. It's still going. You're gone. You're gone. Again, we don't know how long that moment lasted for, but it was crushing to our Savior. And he took it. He could have come off the cross at that point, and it all would have been wasted because he wasn't done yet. But he didn't. He stayed, and he endured, and he endured, and he endured. Um, it's like the exclamation point on it all. And I want to take you now back to another place in scripture where this phrase is repeated. It's why I said this is also a very clear message. Again, because he is an infinite God, he has the capacity to both make a statement out of human suffering and horror mm -hmm. and disappointment and also state a truth and have a underlying purpose. If you go to Psalm chapter 22. This is a psalm that David wrote, and we've actually referenced this several times. We haven't actually read this to you, but it starts out by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David wrote this centuries before, and it goes on to say, I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by people. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. My strength is dried up. My tongue sticks to the roof of mouth. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. In the verse 28, I'm skipping ahead. Dominion belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. And then verse 31, they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. For he has done it. Wow. It continues to bring tears to my eyes. This is, this is simultaneously as Jesus in his humanity cries out for a God that isn't there anymore, references all the way back to this incredible messianic psalm as a, do you know what's happening? In an economy of words, I will tell you precisely what has happened yes. to all the people who are down there and would have known this psalm. It is un- believable. And then we're not told this in Luke, but we are in John chapter 19, verse 30. Jesus says, it is finished. And he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. And I, I want you to know that that, like we have to put it into three words. It is finished. That's one word in the Greek. And the Greek word is to test a lie. Um, maybe you can put that so that they can look it up if they want to see it. He shouts, Tetestali, which not only means it is finished, it also means it is paid in full. This is, un now we're getting to the, starting to feel a little bit better, like I don't want to cry constantly. In ancient times, when a promissory note was paid, the one holding the note would write Tetestali, to tell a sty. To tell a sty. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I practiced it today. I even listened to the pronunciation. I have still. a dear friend who has it actually tattooed across her to arm tell right a here. Sty. And so I've looked at it many times and I think it's beautiful. To tell a sty. Thank you for being patient with me. It's I'm going to let you keep saying it now. I will never get it. It's a beautiful word. It is finished. Yeah, but no, to finish your thought, when they had a promissory note, they would write this across. To tell a sty. It is finished. It is paid. It is done. In full. Completely. Our debt 
paid. Now, don't miss this. If you get nothing else, you have to get this. When Jesus said, Tetelestai, thank you. When Jesus said that, he meant everything. All of it. Paid in full. Done. Paid in full. This means you don't add anything to your salvation. This is why we say this every night. You don't add good works to it. No. You don't add baptism to it. You don't add communion to it. You don't add confession to a priest to it. You don't add anything because to it. Because there is nothing to be added. It exactly. is already done. He did it's it. 100%. It's he full. He did it. And he doesn't, he's not re-crucified every time you take communion either. There is no bringing him down from heaven and like somehow his, his whole suffering and crucifixion happens again. If you're in a religious system that teaches that, that is absolutely antithetical to this. It doesn't it, it work. It is finished. It is it's done. done. It's paid Once for. and for all. And I love that he chose to use a word that had such a transcendental, frankly, um, image associated with it. When you pay off a debt... It is paid off forever. That's right. It's done. Don't revisit. There's nothing, there's nothing more to pay. It is paid off. Once you paid off your mortgage, it's paid off. The bank is done. They'll leave. You walk your direction. When Jesus did this, he paid the debt of our sin 100% in full. Tetelestai, we're done. And it's Dottie finished. says, it is accomplished. I love I, that. I like that too. Yeah. And then back to Luke 23, 45. At this moment that oh. all this is going on, we're kind of pulling from different gospels, trying yeah. to get a full picture. The temple veil is torn in two. What is the temple veil? All right. So once again, not being Jewish, I'm just going to fill you in. So in the temple area, you know, we have all these different courts. You have the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women. Then you have the holy place. You have the holy of holies. Very, very maybe, centered. Maybe you've heard of that. The holy of holies was the place. Um, Emily says, what was the timeline of his statement? <laughs> That's a good question. Okay. I'm glad that you asked that, Emily, because I meant to address. We're not 100% sure what order all of these happened in because they have them in slightly different orders, like not hugely, vastly different, but one before another, and then another will have those turned upside down. So we're not completely sure what order all of it happened in exactly. Some of them are more thematic, but we know it was all like... Within a few moments. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the, the Holy of Holies was where the high priest could only go in one time a year because this is where God's presence dwelt back before Jesus. And on the Day of Atonement, they would tie a rope around his ankle in case he died in there. If he hadn't done it right, he would die in the presence of God because he wasn't prepared. And he would go in with just great trepidation and he would offer on the Day of Atonement a sacrifice for the entire nation. And he would get out of Dodge as fast as he possibly could because that is a scary place to be in the Holy of Holies knowing full well if you did anything wrong, <laughs> you had to basically go in perfect, right? So they had to cleanse themselves ahead of going in there with sacrifices and yes. prayer. And then, I mean, the th thought always is if you go in and have a sinful thought, you're toast. Like, yeah, done. So, so they you drag you out with that rope. That's it, why they tied it it's to you. horrifying, you know? And so because they had an understanding of the power and the authority and the righteousness and the holiness of God. An unholy and unrighteous and imperfect person cannot be in the presence of a holy, righteous, perfect God. And so they had this huge problem, right? And so this huge, thick curtain, this tapestry was there to separate them from the holiness and the perfection of God himself. So they wouldn't all die. You couldn't. Exactly. You didn't have access to God. I mean, I want us to get that. You couldn't just pray to him. You had a to. regular person couldn't just go in and be with God wasn't an option. No, no, because because the blood of goats and lambs and, and birds and whatever they had. It, it was just a band-aid. It was looking forward to that someday there would be that perfect sacrifice, but they didn't have it yet. So it was just a little band-aid on a great big gaping sinful wound that never really did the trick. It was just very, very temporary. Some extra biblical sources, meaning not found in the Bible, but in contemporary writings, say that the curtain was up to four inches thick. It's insane. We're talking enormous and, and 60 feet um, up and down. So this curtain 
would be unrippable. I mean, there's just no way any person can rip it. But if you did try as a, as a person, you would have to go from bottom to yeah, top. Obviously. Well, I didn't mean to put that in your face there. <laughs> Noelle, tell us about why this is so significant. Well, because the curtain didn't tear bottom to top when this happened. It tore top down. Only God, do you understand this? It's not possible. God says, yes. when Jesus says, it is finished. God says, you now have access to me. The, the, when Jesus says, it is finished and he dies, the separation between man and the holiness of God is removed. It is torn. And now you as an individual have access to the God of the universe because you can now be perfect and holy because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Only because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is the only way to do it. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. This is a New so Testament great. book that was written quite a bit later than the Gospel of Luke says, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. That would be the Holy of Holies. We can enter the metaphorical holy of holies. And let's not forget that word with confidence. Nobody had ever entered with confidence before. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's not right. something you did because you had zero confidence in yourself and your ability to, first of all, certainty that you were perfect and had been fully covered by the blood. And then secondly, that you could maintain that throughout the course of the interaction. Yeah, it was a scary place to be. Not now anymore. We have so let me confidence. back up. Hebrews 10, 19, 20. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. He is the curtain between God and us, and he opened it with his blood. Meaning, Incredible. because of him, we have direct access to God. And that came at the cost and the price of what we've been reading for the last three days of Jesus hanging there and suffering and, and suffering the wrath of God and the wrath of, of just the awful things that he went through. All of that torture, he did it so that we could have access to God. What a gift! It is completed. Jesus, it is finished. Why would anyone not want the gift? Uh, it's so expensive. And it's free. I think that's a great, that's a great statement. It's an expensive, it's expensive so gift. Grateful. One of the things I love is that, like you pointed out, there are contemporary um, commentaries and historians, Josephus being one of the major ones who talks about what this curtain was, right? And so from, from a historical perspective, what we always want to give to you is just a really accurate historical understanding of what happened. The Bible is a historical document right? It has to be 100% accurate historically or it's, it's not correct and it's not worthwhile, right? And so we take from a lot of contemporary sources to determine the historicity of the document. And so everything that we've talked to you about over the course of this Bible study, but I'm going to single out the past three sessions, is historically accurate. And so you have to make a decision at that point and go, okay, these are real events that happened. These were all real people. Jesus was a real person. He really did die on the cross. The temple curtain was torn. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to, am I going to believe that that was done for me personally as an individual? Or am I going to relegate that to a world of history and that works for other people? And I want to take a moment and just say, this is, this is so important. I mean, you can't have a document like this written and not just have your mind blown. And I've appreciated during this, many of you have been like, my mind is blown. Oh, I can't too. believe this. The brilliance of God, the extraordinary transcendental nature of this book, the ability for it to transcend centuries and millennia to speak to us today. For me, mm -hmm. that's a huge part of why I believe that Jesus is my savior is because no man could have come up with this. And what we, what we then know, if I'm going to accept that this is a historically accurate document and that what I'm reading is correct, then I have a really important decision to make. And that is, am I going to do what that man on the cross did and say, Jesus, I am guilty and you are not. Would you apply your perfection to me, your righteousness to me? 
or am I going to be the guy on the other side of the cross saying actually in very similar words but mocking him and choosing choosing to do it myself and ultimately dying um, and so if, if you're at a point where you're like I believe that Jesus did this for me if you're saying I understand my sin I understand that I'm guilty and you have an understanding of what that is and you want to accept Jesus as your savior, I'm gonna say a really short prayer. I'm going to say the same things that that, that criminal on the cross said because we're just as guilty as he was. But Jesus in the same way is offering us forgiveness in the same way that he offered it to that man. Amen. So if that's where your heart is right now, would you just out loud wherever you are, take a moment, set down the phone, just make this about you and God make this special. Would you just say these words with me, Lord Jesus, I am guilty. I am sinful. I can't do this on my own. I can't reach perfection on my own. And I am separated from you. And I, I hate what this world is. And I hate what my sin is. And I hate not being at one with you. So Jesus, would you forgive me mm -hmm. of those sins? Would you would you replace my unrighteousness and my sinfulness with your perfection yes. and your holiness? Yes. Lord, I want when you look down on me that you see the perfection of Jesus, not my sin. Amen. And I, I'm confident that you did that when you died for me on the cross. That when you said it is finished, you yes. meant that it is finished for me specifically. And I thank you for that, Jesus. And I will follow you with my life because of that, just out of gratefulness to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Oh, we hope that this has been meaningful to you. And by the way, that's one of those situations that we pray with you every night, that if you pray that and you mean it deep down in your heart, like you understand it, you mean it, that's not a prayer that you need to keep praying with us every single no. night. Because when Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. <laughs> it's finished. And when it's when it applied died. to you, it's finished, right? Yeah. So you don't have to continue to re-up, re-up, re-up. We do ask for forgiveness to keep that relationship strong between us and God. But we'll never remember every single sin to ask for forgiveness for. We just can't possibly keep up Jesus with what we do. Jesus finished it. Right. I, I was on the phone prior to this with a, a dear dear friend of mine from college, one of my best friends from college, mm -hmm. who is a very observant Jew mm -hmm. and is very, very active in that community. And I'll tell you what, it is really hard to, to listen to somebody who is trying so hard to maybe be good enough and trying to follow the law and trying to follow the rules. And he's doing it in a religious system. Maybe you're doing it in just a moralistic system. Um, there is death in that and there is there is incredible anxiety and fear and sadness in that and I don't want any single person who tunes into this broadcast to continue living life in that sort of anxiety and fear and depression because Jesus will give you confidence. I love that passage from Hebrews. We have confidence to enter the most holy holy right. because of what Jesus did. For Not because of us. No, entirely because of what Jesus did. And I want every single one of you to experience that. And the reason we say that prayer with you every single night is because we don't know who's watching. We don't know where you're at in your spiritual walk, but God does. And he, he wants you. And he did this very specifically for you. He knows you, and we want you to experience that because it's changed our lives. He loves you, and so do we. Don't forget to pray for our sister Bible study hubber, Kim, tomorrow with her surgery. Yes, please. And uh, for the doctors to have success. Um, all right, you do your outro. We love you guys. Go make good decisions. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you.